Happy Memorial Day, and thank you for joining with the Live Oak Church family for worship this morning. Take a minute right now and comment to let us know that you're worshiping with us. If you haven't done so, click the bell so you can get notified of future content and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Also, if you're new, or if you'd like to dialogue with the elders about this sermon or other matters, such as asking for prayer, shoot us an email at liveoakchurch at gmail.com. I want to say thank you to our Live Oak Church family for staying engaged as a family with your life groups. The whole reason life groups exist is so that we can encourage one another to walk in agreement with his word. That requires encouragement. That does require prayer. Thank you for staying connected. It is an honor to be a part of helping to lead a body of Christ that is so in love with one another and reflecting the heart of God to each other. So thank you, continue to stay engaged. I also have two words for you as we're preparing our hearts for worship. Family, business. What comes to mind when I say that? You might think of a restaurant, for example, that, that somebody starts and he brings his kids along with him in it. When I think of family business, I just think of laundry. Loads and loads of laundry, ever revolving door, in and out, clean, clean, clean. There's so many different items of business that come in to running a family. And yes, laundry's part of it. There's all kinds of cleaning that, that goes on at the house. There's all kinds of training of kids. There's food service. There's, of course, getting the job that actually brings in the income to help support the family. Family business encompasses a lot. Our Heavenly Father is about a mission to restore this broken world. And he brought his son into that mission, sending Jesus, who said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. If you put your hope and faith in Jesus, you have been commissioned into the family business, as he called us to make disciples, which includes sharing the gospel and pointing others to his word. Are you engaged in the family business? There are so many different things in this world that take our time. Jesus is going to return and everything will be set right. In the meantime, are we focused on the family business? As we go into worship, I want us to think prayerfully about a step or two steps that the Lord may be calling you to participate in his business, in the family business. Let's pray about that. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being so good, not only to open our eyes to your goodness, not only to save us, but to give us the privilege of participating in your work to restore this broken world. God, open our eyes to how we spend our time. Help us to prioritize investing time and effort in the family business, in kingdom matters. Show us how we can do that and help us to rejoice in you today in your graciousness that you allow us to participate in your good work. We thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. Transform our lives and hearts with your word. And I ask this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Never heard a sweeter voice 
You know, if there's anything that I've learned over these past few weeks, it's that my priorities have been askew. When I look at my relationship with Christ and how much time I put to other things, how much time I look to other things to be my comfort and to be my joy. Not only does it bring conviction, but it brings a sorrow. Our prayer should be that God be glorified above everything. And so this next song is that prayer. Let our lives bring glory to him. Let my life bring glory, glory to you. Let my life bring glory, glory to you. Let my life bring glory, glory to you, only to you. Let the words I speak be honored. I pray Let my life bring praise Sing it with me, let my life Let my life bring glory Glory to you Let my life bring glory Glory to you Let the steps I take be filled with faith. My every breath before your sake always. Let my life bring praise. 
my joy, my pain, I dedicate in all I face. My hope remains always. Let my life bring praise. Let What activities are you engaged in today in order to affect a positive future outcome? So what are the things that you're doing today because you know the engagement of those things gives you the future you're hoping for? An, an example, uh, people set aside money every month for retirement because they anticipate that is going to bring about a better future at that time, or maybe you're getting certifications or education or something like that because it is your expectation that my engagement in those things now affects a better future. It results in a better future. Well, can I submit to you today that the Bible gives us instructions on what we can be engaged in today that gives us a better outcome, a better future. And we find that teaching in the form of a parable. The parable is located in Luke 19. We'll pick up with verse 11 and it goes all the way through verse 27. So let's read Luke 19, 11 through 27. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman, sent, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minus and said to them, engage in business until I come. 
But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered the servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made 10 minus more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. And the second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. Then another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I have kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in a bank and at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the minus from him and give it to the one who has the 10 minus. And they said to him, Lord, he has 10 minus. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Now, many Christians might read this passage and, and see it as a passage of warning to them. But in fact, it's not. It is actually a passage of encouragement to those who are in the kingdom of God. Jesus tells us, or Luke records for us why Jesus told this parable. And he's telling it to the disciples for them. So let's look again on why he tells the parable. He says there um, in 11 that they were coming close to Jerusalem. And because, there in verse 12, uh, verse 11, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So the disciples had in their mind, Hey, we're, the journey's almost over. We are almost in Jerusalem. And when we get to Jerusalem, Jesus the Messiah will be crowned king. The kingdom will appear immediately. And yet again, we see Jesus letting them know the fact that the kingdom would not appear immediately. We've seen it already in Luke. We see it again. They had in their mind, Jesus is going to, Whatever's going to happen, Jesus is going to establish his kingdom immediately. That's why we're going to Jerusalem. But the fact is, Jesus is trying to prepare him that he is going to die. He is going to be taken from them. Even when he is resurrected, he's going to ascend. They are going to be on earth for a while before the kingdom is established. So that's the why he tells them this parable. And you go, well, then why this parable? It's to let them and us, since we are still in the time waiting for the king to return, is to let all the disciples know what we are to be doing while we wait for the king to return. And we are waiting. The, the, this is a most appropriate passage, of course, because Jesus tells us that. But it fits so well with all that scripture teaches us about Jesus. That he is waiting. Hebrews 10 tells us that he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. And in uh, Philippians, we are told that because of his humility, God has given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess in heaven and earth and under the earth, that Jesus is Lord. So there's going to be a time when Jesus comes, establishes his kingdom, and all will recognize him as king and as Lord. But that time is not yet. Peter 
helps the church understand that, that he's writing to. And in 2 Peter, he speaks to this delayed coming of the king. And those who are ridiculed in Christianity at that time, and maybe even today, are saying, you know, well, he's slow. What's the problem? We've been waiting now for 2,000 years. What's the problem? They, they were even saying it then. We've been waiting for several decades. What's the problem? And Peter helps us understand the delay. So Jesus in this parable is the nobleman who's gone off to receive his kingdom and he intends to return. But why the delay? Why not return immediately? And in 2 Peter 3, verse 8 Peter helps us understand, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, speaking of the promise of a return, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance." But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heaven will pass away and he goes on to describe the day of the Lord. So Peter helps us understand why the delay? Because the king, the one who went off to receive his kingship, he is patient waiting for all to repent, giving all the opportunity to repent. So what are we to be doing? So this disciple, this parable is to help the disciples prepare though they don't know it yet now they're looking back going oh yes now we see Jesus was teaching us what we should be doing while we're waiting and what is it that we should be doing well if Jesus is the nobleman who went off to receive his kingdom then the servants who received the minus are his disciples they are the apostles and what are the apostles to be doing during that time? He says there that they are to be engaging in business. It says, calling there in verse 13, calling 10 of his servants, he gave them 10 minus and said to them, engage in business until I come. So what were the disciples to learn from this parable. Well, one of them, in fact, the main point of this parable is, until I return, engage in business. And what is the business that they were to be engaged in? What is the business that you and I are to be engaged in? Kingdom business, the business of the king. See, this, this parable is not about money. Money is used as part of the illustration to help us understand, but it's about our engagement in kingdom business. What are we to be doing while we are waiting for the king to return? We are to be engaging in kingdom business. Now we can read the end of this parable and think, oh yeah, because the king's gonna come and he's gonna, we're gonna have to give an account and he's a harsh judge, but that's not at all what this passage is teaching. Not to those who are in Christ. What we see in his treatment of those who are in Christ is him being generous and gracious to those who are engaged in his kingdom. One was more engaged, if you will, was more successful, quote unquote, than the other. But he is still generous to them. And so you and I and the disciples should see this and go, the king is generous to those engaged in his kingdom. But notice something else about this engagement in kingdom business. Who, who's, where's it happening? What are the people like that it's around? And, and he points out that the people of the king's kingdom do not want him to reign over them. They don't want him as king. So you and I learn, one of the things we learn from this passage that our engagement in kingdom business is going to be around and among people who don't want the king. They don't want Jesus to be king over them. And in fact, we find that to be true. And it has always been true. Scripture told us that the, the way of salvation is narrow and it continues to be narrow. The majority of people don't want Jesus to be king. So therefore, they don't want the servants of the king. 
who are about kingdom business. They don't want them. Not if they're going to be about kingdom business. This is why Jesus told the disciples, listen, the world's going to hate you because it hates me. It's not you, it's me. It, but they don't want me to be their king. But yet you and I are still called to engage in kingdom business among people who do not want the king. But we should be encouraged by the fact that he is again generous to the, his faithful servants. Those who are engaged in kingdom work, he is generous to. So even though we are doing kingdom work among people who don't want the king, we can know that our king is not only with us, but that our king is generous and gracious to us as we are working in kingdom business. So perhaps you're, you remember what I just read and you're going, but wait, wait a minute. Didn't that one servant say that he was severe and harsh? Well, let's talk about that one servant. We find him again in verse 20. Then another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not sow. So that is his reason. It's really an excuse. But that is his reason for not engaging in kingdom business. Well, Lord, I didn't engage in kingdom business while you were gone because I know you are severe and harsh. And the Lord picks up on that lie, the nobleman in the parable. He picks up, that is a, that is a complete fabrication. It is an excuse that this man made up so that he did not have to engage in kingdom business among people who did not want the king, representing a king they didn't want. So he makes up this excuse. Lord, I know that you are severe and that you are harsh. And the answer of the nobleman proves that he sees right through this guy's lie. Look at how he answers him in verse 22. He, the nobleman, said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, and, and I, it helps if you read it with a little bit of sarcasm. You knew that I was a severe man taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. In other words, you knew that was true? Then why didn't you at least invest it so that there would be some interest or something. If you really believed what you have just said about me, your actions would have been different. If you really believe that I'm a severe man, if you really believe that I'm a harsh man, if you really believed that, then you would know that I would not be satisfied with you returning to me what I gave you. But the truth is your actions expose you. You don't believe it. For if you have believed it, you would have acted differently. You'd at least got interest. You'd have said, he's severe, he's harsh. I, I've got to do something. He's not going to be satisfied with this minus I'm giving back. I, I've got to do something. And he's like, but you don't, you don't really believe that. Your actions expose your lie. And the truth is, it was just an excuse. This man did not want to do kingdom business among people who did not want the king. And so when the king then turns around and goes, okay, this is what you've said of me, then this is what you will experience. Your own words are going to be your judgment against you. He again is revealing this man to be a false servant. He's not truly a servant of the king. He's a false servant. And so he is treated as a false servant. What he has is taken from him and is given to the one who has 10. And, and the people around see that and go, well, wait a minute. This guy already has a lot. Why, why are you giving him more? 
And the nobleman says, well, then let, let me let you, let me, let me let you in on a little secret on how the kingdom works here. To the one who has, I'm going to give more. And then he says something that is a conundrum. It's a, it's, it seems somewhat opposite. And the one who does not have, so he doesn't have anything, what he has, I'm going to take away. Well, wait a minute. He already doesn't have anything, but you're going to take away what he has, which is nothing, and even what he has is going to be taken away and, and given away. Well, what's, what's he saying there? What's Jesus helping the disciples understand about the kingdom? And how is it an encouragement to them and a warning to those who are not servants? It is an encouragement to the disciples because they are sent out to do kingdom business among people who don't want Jesus as king. And they're going to experience all that comes with that. But they need to know your king is generous and gracious to those who are engaged in kingdom business. And these people who can appear as though they have much, even in my kingdom, because ultimately Jesus is making the point, I am king over all. Even those who don't want me to be king, I am king. But disciples, as you are serving, you're going to look and it's going to appear that they have a lot and you don't have anything. But understand, they don't have anything. They have nothing because they are not in my kingdom. They don't have me as king. And because of that, they don't have anything. So what they have that they think is a lot, I am taking that away. The truth is the king here is hard. I won't say he is harsh, but he is hard as justice is hard. This man had made up an excuse in his own mind so that he did not have to participate in kingdom business. He could be about his own business. And so the king gave him a just reward. You say you've convinced yourself or that's been your excuse, then that's what you're gonna experience. But the truth is his actions revealed his lie. He didn't really believe it. And I think about those today, if Jesus was telling that parable to the church today, would he change it around? Would he would say, would the servant then say, I refuse to serve a God who would be so cruel as to kill his son. And would the king go, that just reveals, that's an excuse that you are making so you don't have to engage in kingdom business. Because here's the truth. If you really believed the king of the universe, the, the Lord Almighty, the all-powerful one, would cruelly kill his own son for no reason, for no good purpose, if he would do that to one whom I is clear that he loves, then you would be in great fear of him. You would not dismiss him. If he could be that cruel to one he loves, then your actions logically would result in, then I have no standing with him. Therefore, I would act in a way as we see many pagans do. There is a terrible God that we must appease. That would be the logical actions if you really believed that God was that way. So see, You can say that about God, but the truth is it's just an excuse so that you don't have to participate in kingdom business. It doesn't change the fact that Jesus is king. It doesn't change the fact that he will return as king. It doesn't change the fact that those people who hate him as king will be judged. It's just an excuse so that right now I don't have to engage in kingdom business. But here's what we need to check out. This person who was quote unquote a servant who proves himself to be false, this man is, would be one that the disciples would interact with within the body of believers. Maybe he's Judas or maybe he's just representative of all of the false servants of Christ that the disciples would encounter. Paul in Philippians talks about how he's in prison and some are preaching the gospel for good purposes. They have good reasons for doing it. And he goes, but some are doing it out of envy and selfish ambition. So they're doing it not because of the king, they're doing it for their own selves. So we're really talking about the people the disciples are gonna encounter that call themselves servant of the king. 
But here's the truth. They are revealed to be false servants because what they say about the king is false. And they say it not because they're trying to tell lies about the king, but they're coming up with reasons, really excuses, on why they do not have to participate in kingdom business. Just as this servant is here. Well, then I turn to my own heart. Do I do that? Do I find excuses about God so that I don't have to engage in kingdom business around people who don't want Jesus as king? Oh, Lord, please give me your mercy that I would not do that. And, and in doing that, I would be proven a false servant. But for you, disciple of Jesus, who the Lord has changed your life, I want you to be encouraged by this because I think that's the purpose of this for the disciples is to say, I'm preparing you for this time in between. I'm preparing you on what you need to do. And it is gonna be hard, but I am a generous king to those who are faithful in engaging in kingdom business. And those who are not, that you're gonna encounter, they're gonna be a struggle. You don't worry about that. I got it. I'm not fooled. I'm not tricked. So someone may say, well, you know, I don't engage in kingdom business because my own goodness should be enough to get me into heaven. Jesus should accept my morality and how good I am. That should be enough. And then they stand before the king and, and, they, and he may go, oh, so I see that instead of trusting my holiness and my good judgment, you decided your judgment was enough and that if I wouldn't accept you on your terms, then I didn't need to accept you at all. And so I'm going to give you what you asked for. I'm not going to accept you all because I want, at all because I want to accept you on your terms. So you go and be a kingdom somewhere else by yourself. Oh, and by the way, everything that you have is taken away from you. Because those things, as scripture is clear, God is, lets it rain on the just and the unjust. He, he lets the sun shine on the just and the unjust. All those good things, they are from me. As James says, I am the, the every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Those are from me, they're mine. I take them away and I give them to someone else. But you got what you wanted. Your excuse for avoiding engaging in kingdom business, you got that. You got that. So for those who are not engaging in kingdom business, this should be a very concerning passage. But for those disciples who this waiting and this working among people who don't want Jesus as king, understand every time you engage, you are also preparing a better future for yourself. And what is that better future? Christ as king in his kingdom reigning with him, being with him and with his people. That is a better future. And what is the outcome of those who have declared for the centuries that they do not want Jesus as king, who have worked? That's what these people do. They didn't just declare they don't want him as king. They worked. They sent a delegation saying, we don't want him to rule over us. And what was the result? They were destroyed. They were destroyed. Not not true servants of the living king who engage in kingdom business, but those who are not servants of the living king, who then reveal that they are not servants because they do not engage. So if you are one who you're not engaged and that reveals your heart that Jesus isn't king, would you repent? Would you repent and follow Christ? He is a gracious and good king. He is a generous king. Would you humble yourself and gladly kneel before him as your king? But to those who are his servants, would you be encouraged? The Lord sees your investment. He sees your work. He sees your engagement. And he is not ignorant and he is generous to those who are his. So let me give, I want to end by giving just a few practical ways that you can be engaged in the kingdom. You may already be doing these. These are not the only ones. Uh, the scripture is full of things that we as believers should be doing in kingdom. In fact, we see in several places in scripture that we are to walk worthy of the gospel. So how we live matters. I just bring up a few. We see in Matthew 28, the great commission that as we are going, we are to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything that God has commanded. So we should be, that's kingdom business. We should be engaged in that. We, we know the great commandment and John tells us that 
We're to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We love God with everything we got, and we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. So loving our neighbor, that actually is a kingdom business kind of thing. We are to do that. In this passage right before, here in Luke 11, or Luke 19, verse 11, he says, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So as we are participating and as we are part of seeking and saving the lost, we are participating, we're engaging in kingdom business. And then I want to end on one passage that really is very specific in that regard. So we looked at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, where he talks about, you know, the Lord is slow, or don't count the Lord as slow, a thousand years as a day, and a day is as a thousand years, and that the Lord is patiently waiting so that people can repent And so Peter describes this and then he says in verse 14, therefore beloved, since you are waiting for these, you're waiting for the day Christ returns and that he makes and establishes a new heaven and a new earth. The old is truly gone everywhere and his kingdom is established and it's all new. He says, while you're waiting on that, what do you do? While you're waiting on the day of the Lord, while you're waiting for the king to return as king, what do you do? And he says, therefore, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Be holy. Care about sin. And then at peace, the, the interesting thing about that word peace there is it's a uniquely Christian word. It's, it's, in scripture, it's uniquely for Christians because it's the kind of peace that only Christians can experience. It, it is the, the way I would describe that peace is a soul that knows its security in Christ, the sovereign Lord, to the point that they are content with life however the Lord deems, that they are content. And he's saying, so be diligent while you're waiting. Be diligent to be personally holy and spotless and to be content. God is sovereign. He is your king. Be content with the life. Be content with engaging where he has given you to engage among the people he has given you to engage in. So what are some practical things you and I could do? Well, We need to seek and save the lost. We need to be making disciples. So in in addition to the things our church is doing, what I would encourage you to do, something very simple that would be a good way to begin that process is ask the Lord to reveal to you three people who are not yet believers in Christ and commit yourself to pray for them, just to intercede and pray for their salvation. And you go, well, that doesn't feel like kingdom work. Oh man, prayer is kingdom. It is kingdom work. That is kingdom business. Engage in kingdom business by interceding for the unbeliever. So pray. Just ask the Lord to do that. Ask the Lord to show you where you are not content and why. Just ask the Lord to show you that and pursue contentment in Christ. You may need to memorize some scripture. And just turn your focus to Christ. Ask the Lord to show you where you are not pursuing holiness and where you are are not pursuing being pure before the Lord. Ask the Lord to show you that. And just show you one thing. Lord, just show me one thing. That is engaging in kingdom business. Ask the Lord to show you. Father, how might I make disciples? How might I be a part? How might I be a part of encouraging people to know you and to know your word? If you've got Children, there's an obvious answer there. That's kingdom business you're involved in. Teaching them God and his ways and his word. That's kingdom business. So you can begin with, begin with family, begin at church. and Live Oak, one of the ways we do that is our life groups. Being involved in life together with other people so that together as a body, you can be family and servants and disciple makers. Together encouraging each other to grow in the Lord. That's being engaged in kingdom business. Here's the the bottom line. Ask the Lord, commit to the Lord. I want to be engaged in kingdom 
business. And I don't want to make excuses and I don't want to find a reason to just put my minus or my mina in a handkerchief. Lord, I want to be engaged in kingdom business and ask the Lord to show you and be engaged. It is the best investment of our future. It's what we can do today that helps ensure a positive future outcome. And may not even be on this earth, but the king is coming. And may he find us faithful because he is generous and he is good to his servants. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are good and generous. Help us to be faithful. Lord, help us to be engaged in the things of you, in those things that are pleasing to you, in those things that you've called us to do in your word. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and just show us what they are and give us the faith to to manipulate our calendar even if we need to, to be engaged in those things. And Father, if there are some who are listening and they are not in your kingdom and they are not practicing and being engaged in your business, Lord, the truth is, is that as they've heard this passage and they, you, you Holy Spirit, are revealing them their life, they would have to say, no part of my life is their engagement in kingdom business. May they take that to heart. And Lord, may they repent and call you king. Would you do that? You are a gracious and good God. Lord, would you do that? You are delaying your come, your coming so that people can repent. Lord, would you draw them to repentance? Thank you for your goodness to us. May you be worshiped always by all people. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. to you.